thanks to COVID-19, our stress levels may be off the charts. For those women who experience chronic pelvic pain, stress can cause their pain disorder to worsen. I'm Jessica Salazar with Overland Park Regional Medical Center, a part of HCA Midwest Health. Joining us is urogynecologist, Dr. Charles Buttrick, a board certified OBGYN and female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgeon with Overland Park Regional Medical Center. Thank you for joining, doc thank you for joining us, Dr. Buttrick. Oh, thank you for having oh. me. So Dr. Buttrick, nobody talks about chronic pelvic pain or chronic pelvic dysfunction, and it's more common than we think. How common is it? Well, in fact, 15 to 20% of all women suffer with chronic pelvic pain. We call chronic pelvic pain as pain that's been going on for at least six months. Oftentimes those patients live in silence. And in fact, only one third of patients actually go to their provider for evaluation. The sad thing is, is that 20% of patients with chronic pelvic pain have pain of a gynecologic nature. That means 80% of the time, the pain is coming from something else. And so if the only provider they see is a gynecologist, you'll want to find a gynecologist that has a full armamentarium and understands how to look for the cause for the pelvic pain. How should patients with chronic pain, chronic pelvic pain be evaluated? Well, first off, pain that goes on for many months is never normal. And a careful evaluation to identify each of their pain generators is really the key in understanding how to treat and help patients with chronic pelvic pain. It's important to realize that any pain, and it doesn't matter if it's bad menstrual cramps or if you actually have endometriosis, or possibly you have a muscle injury involving low back pain or even arthritis, any pain that goes on for several months, there's a change that occurs within the spinal cord and actually within your brain. And we call that centralization of your pain. Now the nerves become hypersensitive. Things that used to not hurt start becoming uncomfortable. So patients would describe that maybe my menstrual cramps were bad, but now I have pain with intercourse or pain with bowel movements. Their pain characteristics are involving now other organs. I start having bladder symptoms. I start having problems with constipation, alternating with diarrhea or pain with bowel movements. And before it was just pain that I had with menstrual cramps. So the key is to realize that the pain has changed over time. And now that the pain is centralized, the provider that cares for that patient needs to realize that their job is to identify every pain generator. That usually is done through a careful history. You have to listen to the patient and let her tell the story. We use many questionnaires in our practice to help identify each of the organ systems that might be involved in this chronic pain state. And then we take on the challenge to treat each one of those pain disorders or what we call pain generators. Sometimes it involves the female organs with endometriosis or fibroids. More commonly, it's outside of the gynecologic area involving muscles that are too tight, bladders that are irritated, making you feel like you need to urinate every 30 minutes or an hour, or problems with your bowels, as I said, alternating constipation, diarrhea, pain with bowel movements. But one of the most common pain generators in patients with chronic pain involves the muscles. It's only natural. If you have pain frequently, we clench. And the more you clench, your muscles become tight and uncomfortable. Each one of those are targets for our therapy, and we need to make each one of those pain generators turn off. How has COVID-19 made symptoms worse for your patients with chronic pelvic pain? Well, as I mentioned earlier, many patients with chronic pelvic pain have had pain so long that their nerves become hypersensitive within the spinal cord. Now, the way we all try to control how we process pain, and we all have a certain degree of pain every day, is we modulate those signals 
from our brain going down into the spinal cord to try to turn off those nerves and keep them from being hypersensitive. For years, we've known that people that are under a lot of stress, patients with depression, anxiety disorders, these are patients that do not modulate or turn off their pain very well. Well, when we're under stress, and gosh knows the pandemic mm -hmm. we're under is triggering uh, stress in all of our patients, that stress inhibits our ability to modulate or control our pain. Mm -hmm. I know in my own practice, I've seen thousands of patients with pain. We get their pain turned off and things are great. And then they have stressful events, maybe a, a problem with losing a job or a husband has died or COVID-19 where you're afraid to leave your house. And those patients, as a result of stress, it allows that pain to leave its state of remission and become activated again. They get back into my office. We try to reinitiate some of the therapies that allowed them to turn off that pain. And we typically can capture their ability to turn off the pain in short uh, uh, events like this. Let that pain go on for six months, a year, and two years, and then come in to see me. It's much harder to turn off the pain. So we have a lot of patients coming to the practice now that are having a flare in their pain simply brought on by the COVID stress. So don't put up with that stress. Don't put up with the pain. Get into your doctor and have them help you through your daily pain issues. Because if they don't take care of that pain right away, could they then develop a new condition? Absolutely. It becomes centralized. And that again, the key finding is multifocal pain. I didn't used to have pain with bowel movements. It was just pain with intercourse and the bladder was bothering me, but you took care of that. But now I have pain when I'm trying to pass stool or when I'm sitting in a chair. That's a new pain disorder brought on by COVID stress. Yes, we see it on a regular basis. Your specialty, what makes a urogynecologist um, different from an OBGYN? Well, an OBGYN has completed a four-year program understanding about uh, gynecologic uh, problems, also obstetrical issues, because of course they deliver babies. A urogynecologist is a physician, typically a gynecologist, but they can also start from a urology residency, mm -hmm. and they will take care of female pelvic floor disorders. And so remember within our pelvis, we have our female organs, but we also have our bladder, rectum, pelvic muscles, ligaments, nerves. And so a pelvic floor specialist deals with each one of those organ systems and problems associated with those organ systems. So you're specially trained um, to work with um, these conditions. And those are commonly referred to as pelvic floor disorders. Now to take it one step further though, I've always had a special interest in pelvic pain. And in fact, I was one of the founding members of the International Pelvic Pain Society. Now that's a society made up of not only gynecologists, physical therapists, basic science researchers, neurologists, these are all providers that have dedicated their practice to the management of pain disorders. Now that society is an ideal spot for patients to go to, that's pelvicpain.org, and they can actually find a provider who's a member of that society. Not all urogynecologists have a specialty in pelvic pain disorders. But as I said earlier, Many patients that have chronic pelvic pain will have problems with their pelvic floor muscles, and therefore they oftentimes will have pelvic disorders involving the pelvic floor, such as pain, bladder infections, constant burning in the vaginal area, pain with bowel movements, or even fecal incontinence, blood in the stool. And so a urogynecologist also oftentimes comes in contact with these patients because we are able to take care of all of these problems. But not all urogynecologists 
have a practice that specializes also in pelvic pain disorders. A little bit different. Now, once you have um, diagnosed a patient with chronic pelvic pain, what does that treatment look like? The key really is identifying every pain generator. As I mentioned before, the nerves become hypersensitive and the majority of patients have more than just one problem going on. On a regular basis, I see patients who have undergone hysterectomies because of bad menstrual cramps or possibly even the diagnosis of endometriosis. But we know that 60% of patients that go through those hysterectomies for endometriosis have persistent pain afterwards. The pain specialists, such as myself, would look for those other pain generators. The female organs are gone. So we're looking for the muscles that are too tight, the nerves that are hypersensitive, the bladder that is still irritated and it makes the patient feel like she needs to urinate every 45 minutes, but when she gets to the toilet, she cannot even start her stream and has what we call hesitancy. And so we identify each pain generator and then we treat those pain generators. That oftentimes involves medications, physical therapy to get the muscles to relax. We commonly use Botox in muscles also to help muscle, muscles to relax. There's been a major breakthrough in the management of this muscle pain disorder using a proven technology called photobiomodulation, which is where we use a therapeutic laser that actually is producing near infrared stimulation to the mitochondria it relaxes the muscles and it actually turns off those nerve fibers that have become hypersensitive. Uh, I was involved in the development of that treatment. That's called SOLA therapy. And we now have 20 of those machines throughout the country at pelvic pain centers. We have a 70% response rate and half of those patients will have resolution of their pain. Even though they've suffered with it for years, this new therapy is making all forms of pelvic pain markedly improve in 70% of patients. And oftentimes it resolves. And you are using the latest treatments to help your patients. There are therapeutic or non-surgical treatments and minimally invasive and robotic assisted surgical techniques that your patients are benefiting from. How do you decide what treatment works for each patient? Well, as I mentioned, you want to identify each pain generator. And since we know that surgeries can trigger chronic pain, we typically start with a non-surgical approach. If there is a focus of pain is, for example, an area of endometriosis involving an ovary, uh, possibly severe adhesions, uh, there are times that surgery is done, but oftentimes surgery will actually trigger more pain. So a non-surgical approach, physical therapy, uh, Botox injections, uh, drugs to turn off those nerves that are hypersensitive. Uh, those are the more common approaches. I do do a surgical approach where we stimulate the nerves that carry those pain signals. That's referred to as neuromodulation. And that technique for pain management is also quite beneficial. About 50% of selected patients will have improvement. That's a common approach I use for patients with interstitial cystitis, for example. We also have a few questions from some of our Facebook viewers. I recently had a baby and my pelvic floor doesn't feel the same. What can I do? Well, actually that's a relatively common problem. It is referred to as postpartum pain disorder. And in fact, 10% of the time when a woman delivers a child, they will injure their pelvic floor muscles. Now we all know that when a muscle becomes injured, it goes into spasm or it tightens up. And that is the muscle tension that your patient or your uh, viewer uh, on the web has suggested. She feels that typically as a feeling of pressure or heaviness at times with sharp shooting pain, suddenly shooting in the vaginal or rectal area. 
And when that happens, that's called proctalgia fugax and is a classic description of something that will affect about 10% of women who have had a vaginal delivery. Uh, again, when the muscles are injured, just like in your neck or your low back, physical therapy, muscle relaxers, we can actually resolve that pain quite easily. One of the keys to chronic pain is to initiate therapy early, diagnose the etiology of the problem and treat it before it becomes ingrained and those nerves become so hypersensitive five and 10 years later that then it becomes much more difficult to treat. Another question, childbirth has been my last straw after years of piled up stress and anxiety that caused me to tense not only my shoulders and jaw, but also my pelvis. I feel like I have a tension headache in my pelvis. What is causing this? Uh, again, a classic description. And in fact, a physical therapist that's well known has written a book where she commonly describes it as the pelvic headache. And in fact, the majority of migraine headaches nowadays are thought to be caused from muscle tension. And that certainly is what's going on in her pelvis. Muscle tension can be triggered by many different things, stress, anxiety. You know, I commonly see it, unfortunately, after twins. You know, you're overwhelmed with childcare. You're not sleeping. And we all know that if you don't sleep, your muscles tend to be tighter the next day. So postpartum pain disorders, muscle tension, neck, shoulders, low back, et cetera, all those can trigger that. We see it a lot in our older patients, for example, mm -hmm. as they have back pain, maybe related to some herniated disc or even some minor bulging disc or even arthritis. When people walk with a limp as a result of maybe arthritis in their knees, that throws their pelvic floor out of kilter, out of balance, and they'll develop muscle tension and they'll start having vaginal pain, an achy, a heavy, a pressure, a discomfort that makes them feel like they need to have a bowel movement or to urinate all the time. Again, pelvic floor disorders are very common and it's thought to affect one third of patients. Are there exercise routines that women with chronic pelvic pain should stay away from? Well, and in fact, there are, that's a very astute question. One thing to remember, Again, the muscles are commonly involved in chronic pelvic pain disorders, but we've all experienced that when you exercise, sometimes it's not during the exercise, it's afterwards mm -hmm. that you're really the most sore. Muscle pain is oftentimes delayed. So when you're out working in the backyard and the next day you're really sore in the pelvic area with pressure and discomfort, that physical activity took your muscles that were already tight and it made them more uncomfortable but you might not notice it until the next day. So that's the first take home message. Listen to your body and realize that many of your chronic pain symptoms will be triggered afterwards. A classic symptom I see commonly. Intercourse is a little uncomfortable, but the next day I have severe burning and pain. My discomfort is worse the next day. Again, that's a classic muscle symptom. As far as exercise, Anything that involves clenching, squeezing your pelvic floor muscles really tight, leg presses, high impact aerobics, jogging. And in fact, anyone who does long distance jogging knows about the piriformis muscle as a common trigger to pain involving deep in the buttocks, especially pain with sitting. These are all classic symptoms triggered by long distance running that not everyone experiences. But if you have that, trying to work through that pain is not the right thing to do. Get diagnosed, get into a physical therapist, let them help you with that muscle pain before it becomes chronic. Early diagnosis and treatment again. Bicycle riding, finally. Again, I love bicycle riding, but the bicycle pushes right up against the pelvic floor muscles. And if you already have chronic pain disorders that might involve your muscles, You'll find that that bicycle riding, especially long distance, can be a problem. Now, you, you've you mentioned physical therapy a few times. There are physical therapists who specifically help um, with pelvic floor disorders. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yes. And in fact, we're blessed in the Kansas City area to have about 30 or 40 of the best physical therapists in the Midwest. I teach classes to physical therapists on a regular basis because when the patients have chronic pain involving the pelvic area, it almost always 85, 90% of the time involves those muscles becoming too tight, like we discussed earlier. Uh, the physical therapist will work those muscles with a technique called myofascial release. Think of it as kind of a pelvic massage where yes, they put fingers in the vagina and massage those muscles to get them to relax. Physical therapists are, will work with both men and women that have this problem. People forget men have chronic pain disorders mm -hmm. as well. And the physical therapist throughout the Kansas City area, I consider some of the best. They won't be teaching you Kegels, which is where you're mm -hmm. squeezing or clenching your muscles. We do that when people have problems with urinary loss, where we teach you how to hold urine so you don't leak urine. They actually will teach you a technique called reverse Kegels, where they teach you to relax the muscles. You might squeeze just for one second and then immediately go into a five or a 10 second relaxation. Take a deep breath, let it out kind of techniques. So we have a couple bladder related questions because you are a bladder expert as well. Sure. Why do I pee when I sneeze, laugh or cough? And that patient is describing stress incontinence. It's actually one of the most common reasons to have loss of urine. And that loss of urine is typically caused by poor support to the urethra. People oftentimes think it's a bladder support problem. It's actually the urethra. If I can use my hand as a model, the bladder as if my hand, and then the urethra, that's where the urine comes out. The sphincter are muscles that wrap around the urethra to help to hold that door closed. But when a person coughs or laughs or jumps, that downward pressure makes the urethra drop just enough to open the door and then a little urine will squirt out. Stress incontinence is treated primarily by getting support to the urethra. And that might be in the form of getting those Kegel muscles to work better. Mm -hmm. There's actually little pessaries. Think of a diaphragm, a latex rubber device we put into the vagina. In my office, I do a lot of laser therapy where we tighten the vaginal tissues under the urethra to provide support. Patients come in over lunch. They get a laser treatment, no downtime. That works about 80% of the time for treating stress incontinence. And then there's surgeries we do, typically referred to as slings to support the urethra. Just like I put my arm in a sling, we're now putting the urethra in a sling to hold up the urethra so that now when you cough, it doesn't drop and open. It's a very easy mm -hmm. problem to take care of that oftentimes does not require a surgical approach. And our last um, Facebook viewer question is, what causes the gotta go feeling? Well, there's lots of different things that will cause that. Uh, I mentioned earlier, some people will have an irritated bladder called cystitis, and that makes a person feel like they need to urinate frequently, urgently. They have to rush to the toilet. Oftentimes that is referred to as overactive bladder dry. Other people will have the urge that's so strong, they'll actually lose urine. That's called urge incontinence, or another term is overactive bladder wet. Those patients oftentimes will describe large accidents, and very quickly, they're afraid to leave the house because of that accident being so large. There's medications we use for that, physical therapy again to get the muscles to work better, and we use Botox for that. That works beautifully for this problem. And that's a simple office-based procedure where we inject Botox throughout the wall of the bladder, just like using Botox across your forehead to get rid of wrinkles. And we actually use a little battery, sort of like a pacemaker, but instead of for the heart, this is a battery that stimulates the nerves that go down to the bladder. And it's designed to improve bladder as well as bowel control. It's really the best therapy for patients that have problems with leakage of stool. Now that's a problem that hasn't gotten out of the closet yet, 
but is something that we see commonly in my practice and is very easily taken care of with a little outpatient procedure with the placement of this little battery near the tailbone. That's where the nerves are that go down to the bladder and the rectum. This has been very informative, Dr. Buttrick. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And yes. I hope that together we've been able to help a few patients.